Welcome to Framework Fortune. I'm your host, Ben, and we've got a special guest today, Lucas Impossible on Twitter, from all over the place on social media, always talking about history, economics, art, and everything smart. Lucas, welcome to the Framework Fortune Media Network. This is your first video, and your channel is now live in the second part of this interview and debate about the whole bank crisis and economics will be on your channel now so you guys after you're done with this one be sure to link over and go watch the rest of the debate on lucas in the library lucas my friend how are you um i'm great ben thank you thank you for having me on um i've talked to you a lot on twitter uh, we we met in Twitter Spaces. Uh, it's it's uh, it's both new and kind of a little bit intimidating to be on camera, uh, but um, but I'm glad to be here. And what an exciting time! So uh, ask me whatever you want to ask me, and um, and uh, I'm 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 interested I'm interested to hear what you think of what's going on too. Yeah, and you are an open book, so we're going to pick that brain. We're going to find out what your takes are and everything. Right now, the crypto market is pumping. You know, Bitcoin's up to 28,000, Solana around 2259, Ethereum hit 1800. A lot of spikes we're seeing, some altcoins starting to pop. XRP having a really nice big move from the 36 cents all the way up to about 50 cents. All this happening while these banks are collapsing. And one thing I want to point out before we even get into all the articles, because I haven't done much analysis yet uh, on the YouTube channel in a while, oil is at $69 a barrel. Now, gas prices in my area have not went down. They are still above $3. So if barrel, if only a couple of weeks ago, oil was $80 a barrel and now it's $70 a barrel it's $10 less gas prices haven't went down at all then that is the inflation that is what I've been talking about for a long time this is what me and Lucas have been talking about on Twitter you know the dollar is losing its strength and right as it's losing its strength after all this years of inflation and I would say Lucas would agree with me on this bad economic policies we are at this point so, what is the first thing? I mean, how do we even start? There's been, well, I guess it started with what? The Silvergate Bank collapsing? Let's we'll start there. What, what do you know about the beginning of this domino falling? Or this is what, you know, mainstream is saying the domino is that's falling. But re really, the dominoes have been falling for a long time. They're just now catching up to the actual out front public systems where everybody is really, really getting affected. Okay, Ben. Um, I want to, I want to comment on some things you said. Um, you said the dollar's losing its strength. I think the dollar, uh, I think that's one way to look at it, but the United States, maybe the United States is losing its power is another way to put it. And in response to that, um, because we're at a detente at a political level, uh, and nobody talks about the treasurer notice, we all talk about the Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. The Federal Reserve is limited into, you know, what what actions they can take. And so what they have been doing was to try to, um, to narrow the pipe, uh, let's so, say to speak, if, if money flows to, to restrict the, the 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 pipe or, or to 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 raise I think I one way I think about this also in the crypto world is imagine if Ethereum could just raise its gas prices and, and so it's it's trying to it's trying to raise the price of transactions and and um, and bring money back in so what we've been going what we've been seeing is a great squeeze and um, I just I just want to. I do. I don't love the term "strong" or "weak dollar" because that's more about the United States, like political and maybe military power, which is another conversation. 
or this conversation, um, but also bad economic <laughs> policies. I think too that if if you understand um, or if we think about the conversation that we don't have at a state level and that we can't have at a federal level or that we don't have at a federal level um, and 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 also the quandaries that were put in where the world is put in when it runs on a dollar that it doesn't control, then I think that begins to like set us up for a better understanding of what's going on. Anyway, now that everybody's asleep, back to you. <laughs> no, that, that's a good, there's some good points in there for sure that you made. And just for reference, so you know, I have my Nerf gun right here in hand's reach. So if you tell you, have a bad take, I'm going to shoot right at you on the screen with okay, the Nerf gun. Okay. <laughs> the back of my my gut my nerf gun holder there. Oh god, that takes me well. Yeah, that, I like it. All right, that's a new gimmick I came up with for my videos, just to having a nerf gun around just to shoot people for bad takes when they come on. Oh my god, <laughs> All right, <sure>. anyway. <laughs> If I get if I get a couple of them, I want a running count. That's yeah. all I ask. <laughs> yeah, we'll put a little, a little count meter up on the <laughs> a leaderboard. On the yeah, yeah. <laughs> a leaderboard. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right, so I, I pretty much agree with everything you said there. Uh, you know, I mean, it, the dollar is the dollar, though. That is the main transfer of liquid of value. So I, I, I think it is part of this conversation. It is, you know, more backed by the strength and, and assets, you know what you're saying about the United States. But at the same time, the United States assets are shrinking. They've been shrinking. They're all in debt. And that's why we're seeing this, right? You know, that's that's how I'm looking at it. Absolutely. You know, you commented also on the price of oil and, and people, uh, some some people like to call the dollar the petrodollar. Yeah. Uh, I I think uh, I think there's a, there's some truth in that. I I don't like to call it the petrodollar because I don't think it's a you know it's not certainly not a zero sum um, measurement or or it's a, it's not only the dollar or only oil that that runs the world. Um, but it is interesting too that that uh, the I don't know. Um, Do you think? Uh, so I, this is where I'm going to disagree with you. I'm about to reach for the Nerf gun already. Okay. To get <laughs> all the food, all the resources around the world for this global economic system to work, this mismatch of whatever it is at the moment, um, you have to have oil, right? Like, without oil, yeah. no? To get everything around this world? Like, but I'm saying, okay, theoretically... I mean, well you could switch well, to something it, else, but yeah. right now, if we was to switch to everything from oil to something else, what is that one thing that we could switch to? Well, to me, that would be like a a local evaluation of one's time. What do we use oil for but to um, to ignore political questions about fairness? uh to to or to ignore political questions about um jurisdiction who who has a right to be where who's in charge um i mean i don't have a problem with globalism but i don't understand uh why you have to put sushi on a jet and fly it to austin <laughs> texas nine a week um I, I don't i i think that that there are um i think that we trade a lot for time uh, for yeah. oil use, I'll, I'll just put it that way. Now, there's got there's some places though that can't get certain resources like sushi. That was a very good example and a funny one. But you know, like geography plays a big role into all the economics and uh, all the supply and demands. So there's there's countries that don't have certain resources. That's why we've gotten to this point we have. Now, do we need to be fully global like this? I don't think so. I think most continents probably have the majority of the resources needed to survive. Uh, but you are making a good point at where do we draw the line at is what's needed to survive to where or um, McDonald's in Japan is getting uh -huh. ice cream from the United States or somewhere, right? Like there's a, there's, a, there's a line somewhere, but I don't know where that line is at. But there's definitely resources that have to be transferred from 
let's say like let's say like Canada for example. There's a lot of things they don't have because of their geography, so they have to get stuff from Mexico, right? Like they can't uh, really grow uh, kiwis in Canada. But do they need well, kiwis? In, I guess that's the point. Do they need the kiwis to survive? Not really. Well, another way to think about it too is is uh, you know to citizens of the world like like global trade is kind of a, a joke. That's a political question about fairness inside countries. Um, because because I think that's what what it really gets down to too is um, part of part of what's wrong in the world that we don't point out is is if you're if you're disseminating one one measure of value the dollar and running that around the world and then also lying about how much you're making uh so that you can that you can ease transactions um then the price of time especially at local and 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 in areas that are far from the reach of, or of that hegemony like why would anyone do anything um except go chase oil somewhere uh or, or or go chase monetary you know like like go chase places where the the velocity of a dollar is a lot faster like a city and, and i think this is a part of a problem that we see in america and that quote unquote third and second world countries have felt for quite some time and are poised to jump away from the dollar because of the pro that problem but that you know, when I when I think about that too, I don't think that I don't know an inflationary or elastic currency is a bad thing. I think it just has um, it has a, it, it has effects further away from the center of power, and that's what we're reckoning with now as we fracture into a lot more currencies. Definitely, there's some fracturing of currencies. You said. Let's see what was it you said there was something i wanted to touch on oh can you explain what you said by the velocity of the dollar i think the velocity of currencies is something that has slept on in a lot of trading and a lot of financial teachings and stuff like that so uh just touch on that real quick i think that's a valuable lesson in itself well um it's so Im imagine you know like imagine how many times a dollar um is exchanges hands in a in a town of a thousand people 40 miles away from the next town of a thousand people and then imagine how many times it exchanges hands um in a city full of you know high-rise apartment buildings and um there are nine billion you know nine million people in a 20 20 mile um radius from there so that's kind of the velocity of a dollar and then if you think too, oh, actually, this would be very interesting to talk about now because mm -hmm. we can talk about what's happening with banking. Um, because if you think about, well, so, so think about that on a, on a larger, on a, on a larger scale of not just a dollar, but, but think about like what's been happening with banking, with yeah. banking uh, ever since, uh, well, especially 2008, uh, large urban banks have been buying up rural banks for the deposits, um, and uh, that way they can they can loan it out as as business loans or or whatever um, at an, in an urban area because there's no demand for that at a rural area. So rural areas have also seen like not only not only like jobs and everything else drained away. But also, all of their deposits have been sort of siphoned away into larger regional urban banks. Um, well, but the other thing I was going to say about right. about sorry, if you want to, if we can go back to it, but I wanted to talk too about real estate, and and also when you talk about the velocity of the dollar, you should also think about like real estate transactions because um, the you know the federal the Federal Reserve doesn't print money it has assets and some of the greatest of those are real estate or real property and when it needs to make a whole lot of money like 600 billion dollars over a weekend it just raises the evaluation of those and, and so then um that price level is disseminated through the country as 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 property is bought and sold at that new evaluation so um 
Yeah, that's perfect. So this is going to bring us in into everything. You you set the alley oop up so well right there. Real estate is definitely going to be a big factor in all this, like we were talking about in the beginning a little bit, geography, geopolitics. But as you said, the big banks have been buying up the royal, the rural deposits. You can tell I'm from a rural area. I can't even say it. <laughs> but they've been buying up. Well. The, go, go ahead. I was just saying they're buying up the deposits. And now we're seeing these bigger banks like Silvergate collapse and the Credit Swiss banks, which actually this is happening the same way. The bigger banks are buying up all the debt and everything of the banks collapsing. So if we're going, if this has been happening on the local levels, and now it's going all the way up to the top levels. I mean, this is a complete economic breakdown in this uh, system at the moment. Now we're I seeing, mean, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say we're seeing on Yahoo Finance, like the top news articles, banks rebound, lead stock surges, all eyes turn to Fed. Uh, which we're going to get into some of the federal stuff here later in the video. Um, and actually, here's another. This was yesterday from the Wall Street Journal. You know, do your own research, check your sources. But Credit Suisse collapse burned Saudi investors. So it's this is what all this together, this combination is affecting the whole world. You know, if you're in the United States right now, if you're in Jamaica, if you're over in Thailand, you're wherever you're at, this is going to affect you in some way. Some places way less than others. I think Luke's is going to probably make some good points later on about local townships being able to survive through this versus bigger cities. Uh, I definitely can agree with him on the, on some of that stuff we'll get into. But yeah, this is what's happening. The like you touched on the rural area, it's happened on the bigger level, and you even said back to two thousand eight and what happened in two thousand eight, the biggest real estate market crash, except for it did not completely crash. The feds propped up the market with money printing with QE quantitative easing, and that well, is part of this. So, I mean, to me, what's amazing is this time we haven't had a crash. Yet. It's like, <laughs> it's kind of happening. Like, I, I was saying at the beginning of this year, or beginning of 2021, as soon as the Fed said they were, go they were stopping, um, they were going to start raising interest rates. You know, they stopped all the, well, not all the QE, but they stopped at least the zero interest rates and started raising them again. And that started bringing down the NASDAQ, started bringing down the whole crypto markets, pretty much brought down uh, everything in U.S. dollar terms. But we are still so high up, and I think this is what you're alluding to, from just 2000. Like the NASDAQ com now compared to 2000, or even after the well, 2008 spike. Like we still haven't I mean, really had a crash, state. a crash crash yet. I think we may be well, in it. The crash too, I would say, is is where where is the ringing of hands and and the screaming and uh, the wailing and the gnashing of teeth. Um, you, you know, like also last time we didn't have price inflation, um, and we were still we were still making a lot of money. It was being soaked up. I think about the difference in that. Um, you know, it was it was uh, Ford and Chrysler and General Motors. It was it was um, the fear of of like not not being able to produce things or make things in America back in two thousand and eight, and um, and then there's you know just been like twenty years of talk about bringing jobs back to America that have sort of been a joke because um, how can you how can you bring any other job than making money to the place where money is made. Um, so, well, except for tourism. Uh, so that's what I find very interesting too about this time is, is like Nat, last time it was, it was by bad financial practices or, I mean, even think back to Enron, uh, bad financial practices, masking losses that it, that exposed, that exposed problems. This time it was, 
it was well uh the ftx collapse um i i you're more into trading and whatnot. I know that FTX had some holdings in in Silvergate, but part of part of the, um, these failing institutions is um, is is a reflection of a greater like geopolitical battle, mm-hmm. and, and that's the that's the dollar being abandoned in many places or or other, I mean, uh, other alternatives being put forth, and also people not wanting to do what the United States tells them to do. Uh, now you bring up Credit Suisse, and I think Credit Suisse is fascinating too. I don't, I'm not sure many people understand um, how the United States uh, like exercises its soft power, um, but because there are so many more dollars than than um, than other currencies, you know, like to make international transactions, you have to use dollars, and so say after after 9/11 or or uh, or I think even I think it was during da- Daesh or or um, ISIL or whatever. The United States wanted to see uh, where all the money in the world was held, and the Swiss said, "No, we were the country where where people go to hide their money, and and we that's that's our identify that's our identity as a country, and we think that's okay." And we said, "Oh, okay, that's fine. And you can't use dollars anymore. We're going to cut you off from the SWIFT payment system." And they said, oh, well, we need to buy things. So they had to play along. Um, and that exposed a lot of fragility in the Swiss franc back, franc back then because the one thing they had guaranteed, they, didn't, they couldn't really produce. Um, now they have email, Proton. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that's just, those are some of the things that I think about as, as we're going into now, like in, in how it's different from 2008 and how it's eerily similar. Um, cause even when, when banks began to fail last time, it wasn't, it wasn't like banks were rushing to ensure that, um, their, their, uh, depositors were, 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 were going to be okay. They were looking to buy other banks so that they could, they could have more, um, so they could have more depositors and more of a line towards any money being made. Yeah, that's that is a lot of valuable history there. I hope you guys are paying attention. And why you mentioned that Credit Suisse, I just pulled up. The bondholders are enraged as seventeen billion of AT one debt is to be written down to zero. <laughs> <laughs> and that's for credit. That's for Credit Suisse. Yep. I mean, I mean, and that's the kind of haircut that you would expect. I laugh because what was it? SVB, what was Silicon Valley banks and what was Signature banks? Nothing. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, but that's the thing. They're getting bought up. It's a rescue merger says uh, will be written down to zero on the orders of Swiss regulator Finma as part of its rescue merger with the UBS Group AG. So UBS Group AG just happens to be on the NYSC is UBS and Credit Suisse was on CS. So I haven't looked, but I imagine that UBS maybe boosting because it's buying up this maybe it's a bad thing they're buying it up because that because that's what i'm wondering what is all the debt that these banks have is it all debt that is um home loans is it land loans like when all this has been put in u.s dollars all this debt and we know there's way more debt than there is actual allocated u.s dollar like there's there's no question about that with all the inflation like there's just tons and tons of currency that doesn't even exist out there uh is is this all junk is this all junk debt that is not going to get be able to get paid off if the u.s dollar collapses i mean no gonna get off um but the but but look at uh so um I tried to I tried to find it before we were talking, um, but I, I didn't have a chance to. I wanted to get an exact number. Uh, the Capital isn't uh, is a podcast I listened to. Um, I think it was Douglas Brooks, economist on there, uh, pointed out that the uh, that the Federal Reserve's asset sheet uh, jumped four hundred billion dollars in a weekend. And, go, and going back to like oh, you yeah. know, if you own a house and you want to put it on the market. 
and it was at 200,000 and all of a sudden it's at 400,000 and people say, well, how'd that happen? And you're like, well, there's a buyer out there somewhere. And, and that's what's happening now. The federal reserve to go over, you know, it takes into receivership a failed bank because it's the insurer there. And even though it's only on the hook for it used to be a hundred thousand dollars, somehow it's magically $250,000 and wait, no, now it's just anything. And not for like, you know, every, every like Joe American, <laughs> But for venture capitalists and, and for a bank that specialized in venture capitalists and that didn't have any diversity and like, you know, like how many farmers, how many farmers were affected in that bank? Probably zero. How many wine, how many wine merchants? Um, you know, cause it's Silicon Valley. Isn't that, isn't that where wine comes from? Um, right around that area. Yeah. But since probably- Little tidbit: yeah. Since uh, the fires, they haven't been able to grow in the good as quality as grapes before, so their wine sales has decreased in California because the smoke uh, in there changes the flavors, you know. Uh, but I think here's way where we might have a real debate on our hands. At okay, the, who is going to pay for this debt that you're talking about, even if it's junk debt? You said somebody will buy it. Uh, even if the house goes from two hundred, two hundred thousand to four hundred thousand, whatever. But at, in that uh, premise, you're saying they're saying there's somebody out there who will buy it. Who wants to buy this debt? That's why I'm asking: Is it is the debt that they're selling worth anybody else buying? Well, when you when you create money, when you're in control of money, here's the great thing. Even when it's junk debt, you can just create money and you can say, I'm going to give you this money and then you can buy that junk. And then our books are clean because I have the power to make money and I don't have the power to destroy things and I don't have the power to change history. But in the future, I'll just make more money and then you'll have money to buy that and then it'll all be okay. And that's what happens. Right. But that's what we've got to this point now. Who's going to buy this debt? now right well, yeah, the Ameri- like every american citizen is going to buy this debt every and 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 it's not i mean it, it's it's not going to be something that like gets voted on in the house of representatives no it's it's um every american who has a 401k and that is in a managed account and that gets put into massive hedge funds like there will the there will be a, an incentivization plan a coupon a, a I'm not. A, I'm not. I do not think in rates. I'm not a banker. Um, but but this is. I'm this. If I were a politician, this is how I would be thinking. I'd be like, well, we're going to have to make money, and we're going to have to pay it off in the future, and that's how we're going to figure out how to do that. We'll make a stamp. Right. Um, but the problem and, is, so. right now, every U.S. citizen is in. Uh, well, the total personal debt right now is 24 trillion and growing. Credit card debt's one trillion, and average average debt is like two hundred and sixty thousand per household. So, well, so that like how that's uh, what I'm saying. Like they can't, we can't take it anymore. Like that's the well, thing. I don't think the system can take it anymore. It'd have to be an outside source like China um, that would have the more powerful currency, seemingly here soon. If the U.S. dollar or the Fed doesn't do something, they would buy it. They could buy it up, but they're not going to buy it at the prices that we wanted to buy. We want them to buy it up, right? They're going to negotiate and get it for a cheaper price and own more of our geography. So, um, um, I don't know the 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 non-payment or or the um. You know, what happens whenever somebody doesn't meet an agreement is is perhaps like the best lens to look back through history. Um, I, I'm thinking of like, number one, the, the Fourth Crusades and the Doge of Venice, Doge Dondolo, but I, maybe let's not go back that far. But let's talk about World War II and when we started the dollar. Um, I mean, number one, why why would France and Britain and our other quote unquote allies of world war two accede to allowing the U S dollar to be made the denominator for the world currency. And, and that goes to the debt that they had to us. Now we, they, we knew that, that they couldn't pay back their debt and that they were going to have to take a haircut.